growing up, when I did, I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska. Okay, that says a lot right there. <laughs> I mean, there were black people there because we had off an Air Force base. So there was a large black population in a way. But as a kid, I didn't quite realize how segregated even Omaha was until I got a little older. I mean, I remember one time I was in this, um, I was going to, um, gosh, my elementary school, predominantly white. I think there were like five or six black kids in that school. And we moved out of the district, but it was almost time for me to graduate. And the principal who had been there said I could still continue to go because I'd started kindergarten there. Uh, and it was almost time for me to go to um, middle school or whatever they called it at the time. And um, so a new principal came in and she wrote my uh, mother a note in pencil saying, you people. And <laughs> she wanted me out of the school because I wasn't supposed to be in that district. And that was when I first became aware that, oh wow, just a little bit, that there's something not quite right here. Because they had all these little white friends and I didn't really know, even when they sang the song, Eeny, Meeny, Miny, Mo, Catch a Nigger by the Toe, I didn't know I was the nigger. <laughs> My mother told me when she heard me singing, it's like, honey, come here. But, so I remember my mother taking, taking me up to the school and sitting this woman down and saying, wait a minute, you know, and anyway, I ended up being able to stay in the school. But what I'm saying is I didn't realize until I became a teenager in high school that some things, that all the blacks went to one area in the city to go out for the evening and they didn't really live in certain areas and all. So as I got older, there was no black history. Do you know what I'm saying? So yeah, I didn't, I wasn't really aware of all of our accomplishments um, until older, I got a little older and college that sort of thing. And then we we're going through black power. And that's what opened my eyes, really. Angela Davis and all of the things. Nikki Giovanni, of course, that was when I was even older. I was in college by that time with Nikki Giovanni and some of that. But still, uh, college, black power, and all that. That's when my eyes were opened more. I'm a boomer. So, you know, coming from, gee, when I was a kid, just learning everything and then having my eyes open, you know, I went through all a whole periods, different periods of history. It's amazing. I'm going to be one of those people when I'm a little older going back in my day. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> you know, let me backtrack. Earliest memories, really. Listening to radio and I remember I li we lived in Kansas City, Missouri at the time <laughs> and uh, listening to all those old great shows, The Inner Sanctum, um, The Shadow, and um, a phrase I like to use because I think it's so colorful and so relevant when uh, dialogue and the mind's eye were theater. And, it, and that's one of the things that's so true because you're listening to this and you're picturing it and that was theater. That was entertainment and it was so great and the writing in those old shows had to be so on point because there was nothing to look at except what you were hearing. But I remember all those old shows. Uh, my mother was, was working um, as a nurse and going to school and my stepdad was in the service. And so I was a latchkey child. I came home and I would watch TV and that's how I got introduced to so many aspects of the world. And I remember listening to Marian Anderson sing opera and later on I wanted to sing opera. I even remember watching early uh, Pagliacci and, all. and I'm a little kid. But I, I don't know, something about TV, of course, at that stage, it was mesmerizing. And watching all the old uh, space shows 
with the, the rocket ships where even as a kid you could see the little string <laughs> dangling but hey you're a kid and it was cool you know and I became a lifelong sci-fi fan and oh Star Trek, ah, oh, Star Trek Enterprise and all I remember going on all those travels with them loved it loved it and Edward R. Murrow all of those great interviews where he brought all of these people that you would never meet in life but there they were in your living room and you were comfortable with them because he did those kind of very casual, relaxed interviews and he's talking and you felt like you were getting to know these people. Still to this day love those old classic movies of the 40s. Betty Davis and Bogart and, and Lena Horne and all of those. And of course as a kid you didn't get to see those, those and even as an adult unless you were aware of it and went looking for them, those old great black films because that was a separate thing and unless you grew up like in those old southern towns or whatever where they, Oscar Michaud and those people had uh, the, the studios and showed those films, you didn't know about them so all we had were the Betty Davises and all. But they were great, the dialogue was great, the acting, the black and white, oh I still love it to this day, that's my favorite for watching films. I know Turner Classics and the youth, they want everything colorized and all, but black and white, oh it's like the words on a page, <laughs> black and white and yet it's so much color. Um, that's how I think I really started to love the written word, even more so. Listening to all that great dialogue in those, in those views. And one of the other things too, back to when I was a kid watching some of this, Amos and Andy, the original TV show. And it was such a pity when that was canceled because it got caught up in all the NAACP and the, the racial aspects of television and all that. But those were great actors and it showed that we could be stars on, you know, on any medium really. And uh, it was actually the precursor to the honeymooners so, you know, we can only learn to laugh at ourselves. It was good writing and good acting. And I even remember the first Nat King Cole show. I was a little kid, 15 minutes, and there was Nat King Cole. And stars would come on, they volunteered to come on and help keep his, try to keep his show on. So early, you know, early seeing our people do great things. And um, it was kind of sad in a way seeing some of those old movies that I love as I grew up and then you see our characters, poor Step and Fetch, <laughs> who without him, where would all the rest of us, you know, well, the stars and things be? He had to open the door and all the other great actors like that. High school, college, that's when I really became more and more aware of, of our achievements because, you know, Amos and Andy and all that disappeared. And then it was all um, uh, Leave it to Beaver and Father Knows Best and all of those kinds of shows. And finally we got the Huxtables, but my gosh, <laughs> you know, look at all of the kids of my generation that grew up, we didn't have the Huxtables, my kids did. You know, they got to see a whole new world of things where sometimes when I find myself telling my kids, you know, you have to really, as, as black children, you have to this and you have to be more this, they kind of look at me and go, mom, we know. Well, when I was growing up, I didn't. <laughs> you know, I found that out a little. I mean, not that I wasn't aware as I got older, you know, that, yeah, as a, as a black person, you might not get that job. But growing up in Omaha, like I said, we were kind of, it was, we were a little oblivious to it. So we just lived our lives and we had our friends and I was fortunate enough to go to a college preparatory high school that was very mixed. So I saw all kinds of kids and all kinds of kids of different nationalities were my friends and rich and poor and all, not that we were hanging out so much with the rich kids like my children were able to do. 
um, they grew up in Cleveland and in Cleveland Heights. Cleveland Heights had this All-America City Award that they won almost every year for quite a while because there were all types of people there, uh, all financial, you know, diverse, and they had friends of all types. And that's what I wanted because that's the way the world is and I wanted them to have that sense of the world. I didn't want them growing up in an all-anything environment, all black or all white, you know. So they were really fortunate that they were able to grow up and be comfortable with everyone and also get the benefit of all of our black achievements that I didn't get until later in life. When I was, I think in, yeah, in high school, high school, I started dabbling with writing because I really loved my literature classes and I started dabbling with writing but at that time I just sort of experimented with prose and poetry and then I I thought well let's see if I can do something with this I really thought oh, I'm enjoying this and I would write things for my friends and they liked it and so I kept dabbling with it even as uh, I became an adult. And then I found out that poets starved. <laughs> and so I never quite adopted the starving artist theory of life. Oh, it is better to create, you know. And I'm like, well, gee, we're putting ourselves into this. We are, you know, putting our, our energy, our creation, our blood in a sense, but that's going a little far. But I mean, yeah, we're putting a piece of us in everything that we put out there. And I thought, gee, we deserve to get something back for it. And when I found out, gosh, how much we didn't get in return, I sort of put it aside. And then I found I missed it. And I never really thought I could write long prose, short stories and that sort of thing. And I went for quite a while without doing anything. And then one day I sat down, it was after a romantic experience went awry. <laughs> and I sat down and I wrote a short story about it. And at the time I was working for a newspaper. And so I was an assistant to, to the editor, in the metro editor at the uh, Cleveland Plain Dealer. And so I wrote this piece and I took it into the Sunday Magazine editor. And I said, if you like this, you know, here, I said, but if you think it's horrible, that it sucks, please don't just write all that red stuff over it and everything. And I said, just come back, give it to me and say, Bashira, don't ever do this again. And I won't. Well, they loved it and they published it. I was like, wow. And one of the lessons that I learned and I tell other people, and, and, I, and especially uh, children and that, I had so many reporters come to me and tell me how much they loved what I wrote because at the time I really wrote the way people talk. And I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. What I'm saying is several of them said they took classes and all, because a journalist, you do have to learn how to write in that journalistic manner. But so many of them said how their teachers taught the creative spirit right out of them. I never took any writing classes. I was a liberal art because I never quite knew what I wanted to do with myself. So I, one day I'd be, oh, I want to be a psychologist. Oh, I want to be a social worker. Oh, I want to be, I never knew. So I was a liberal art. And I just sat down, like I said, I used to dabble in the pros and it was pretty good. And then that day I just sat down and, and wrote something. And I was fortunate because I was in a good position to be able to hand it to an editor who knew me and you know, and get it published. So many things, yeah, luck, <laughs> proximity, and that sort of thing. But that's still not a guarantee, you know. If your writing sucks, it sucks. <laughs> oh, I was fortunate that they liked it, and it turned out it was pretty good. So I wrote another piece, and it was published, and I wrote another piece, and I had several pieces published in our Sunday magazine. And um, 
And then one day one of the editors in the um, um, art section came to me and asked if I wanted to write a column reviewing magazines. And I was like, oh wow, I don't think I'm ready for that. And this little voice, one was saying, oh, you're not ready. Maybe ask them if they'll wait and come back another time. And this other voice said, do it now. If you may not get another opportunity. All you can do is either succeed or fail. But take that, you know, and I've got this battle while she's talking in front of me. And, you know, you'll review magazines, and la, da, da, da. And I've never done journalistic writing. There's a difference between short stories, fiction, whatever, and journalism. But... I just thought, take the plunge. So I said, yes. And at first, I was horrible. <laughs> I was horrible at it. They would spend time, I'd sit with the, with the editor, and she's showing me what I did wrong, and we're painstakingly going through it. And I almost lost the column, actually. And so I started really, you know, looking more. It's funny, one day I sat down and I looked at this other woman's writing who was also a reviewer of magazines. And I looked at her style and something about it kind of touched me, reached me. And from then on, I just seemed to get it. But I mean, it wasn't like, yeah, it didn't happen overnight. Except it was, I was horrible at first. And then I was really much, much better at it. And I went on to do it and the, most of the time I needed little or no editing. So it was really great, but it was, trial and error and working at it and then I, uh, I was lucky enough I got a couple of, of um, opinion pieces uh, published in Essence magazine and uh, as a result of that a friend of mine um, that I had dated in, in Cleveland and who was originally from LA and had gone back to LA knew the editor of Variety magazine and knew that he was looking for an assistant. He contacted the editor, editor of Variety, said he knew someone, me, and uh, would I be interested in, in doing that. And so the editor contacted me after um, uh, I sent some of my columns and my short stories, some that had been published, some that hadn't been, and he called me. And um, so once again, this duality. <laughs> Los Angeles. I had never ever thought of going there. It was something in the movies. It was, you know, whatever. And I think, I don't know anything about Hollywood, that business, because variety was the Bible of the Hollywood industry. And so I'm thinking, what if you go out there and you fail and blah, blah, and going out there. And so once again, I thought, do it. Because otherwise, I knew I would have been haunted by the what if. And so I said, if I fail, hey, I'll just come back to Cleveland. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> and I went out there, and the thing is, you have to hit the ground running. He, you know, he was kind of an old fogey, and uh, and we kind of meshed because he didn't like to use a computer. And so I would edit a lot of his copy, and not that he needed a lot of editing because he was brilliant, but. Um, I, I did did more, like I said, than just take a take a letter. And I started writing a column for Variety. I wrote the locations column. And um, you know, I was I was I just I became fortunate enough to be a published writer. The thing is so many times I still am hesitant in using that term and calling myself a writer because there are so many great writers that are published and so many great writers that aren't published. And, and you know, it's like I have to sometimes step back and say, Bashira, you are a writer, dear, you're, and you're a blessed writer. You were a columnist and for two major publications, you've had your stories published, and okay, yes, you haven't published the great novel. <laughs> I have a book, of course, in the drawer. <laughs> but, you know, but yes, you're still a writer, and, and that never dies. I, I was talking to someone, and I said, oh, yeah, I'm 
kind of retired now because I'm no longer with Variety and, and um, trying to figure out what I want to do with the next chapter. And she looked at me and she says, how can you retire from writing? And I thought, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she has a point. <laughs> Hello, Mashira. So um, I started writing again, and you know, it's like you pick things up. I think sometimes you need to take a break a little bit, but now kind of the juices are flowing again, and and you know, it's it's like yeah, that if you have any kind of creative spirit, it doesn't die. You may put it on pause, um, but there's always things that spur the imagination. And, and then, you know, so I find myself once again jotting notes and things like that. And I think I'm a good writer. You have to believe in yourself a little bit. Otherwise, yeah, you're always going to crash and burn because you won't ever think you're good enough to do anything and everything will stay in that drawer. And, and I always encourage people like, you know, like the Nike thing, just do it. Just do it because you won't know unless you do it. And if you read something you've written and you think it go it's good, it is. Um, other people may take issue with it and maybe if everybody hates it, maybe you have to step back and go, maybe it isn't as good as I thought it, maybe I should. <laughs> but you can still do it for fun, just for you. But still, just.